In this video, I'll teach you everything you need to know about dandruff and seborrheic dermatitis. We'll go through number one, what dandruff is, number two, factors contributing to it, and most importantly, number three, how we treat it. I'll walk you through my stepwise approach that works in almost everybody. Almost? Some cases are difficult. We'll explore common mistakes to avoid, a few tangents along the way, and I'll reveal my recommended over-the-counter regimen for those of you just starting out. And don't miss my pro tip at the end. Hint, it's a magic bullet that I only reserve for the most stubborn of cases. You might think that this is a simple topic, but if it were really that simple, why do so many people struggle with it? Hint number two, it's not really that simple. I'm Adam Aldahan, board-certified dermatologist, and I've spent a bajillion hours researching and simplifying complicated topics, so you don't have to. What is dandruff? In simple terms, dandruff is our outermost skin cells flaking off more than they should. But life's not simple, and neither is dandruff. It's complicated. Dandruff is what we see as an end result of a process called seborrheic dermatitis. This is caused by a naturally occurring yeast on our body called malassezia. And this yeast likes to hang out around the oils on our face and scalp. It's generally harmless, but if it overgrows, it can cause irritation on our skin. When our skin gets irritated, it can get red, itchy, and flaky, hence dandruff. Before we dive too deeply into that, it's important to first understand how our skin interacts with the environment in general. At baseline, meaning at our normal state without any external intervention, our skin has a natural immunity that fights off bugs, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and maybe your creepy neighbor who always has his nose in your business. And we need this immunity to keep us healthy. Otherwise, we'd all be walking around with ringworm, bacterial impetigo, warts, and a whole host of other things. Not to mention more serious infections. Every day, every minute, every second, there are millions of micro battles going on between our body's immune system and these bugs that are trying to get in. Most of the time our skin wins. We don't come here to lose. But sometimes the bad guy makes his mark in our territory. This can happen for many reasons. Sometimes if the bug is new to us, we're not prepared to take it on. Other times the bug isn't necessarily new, but it's just really strong and it can outlast our immune system for a short while. Other times, as with dandruff, the bug is not new to us and it's not really all that strong, but it's also not seen as much of a threat, and so our immune system kind of tolerates it. People with weakened immune systems are more susceptible to developing dandruff than the average population. Now, our immune system doesn't target the malassezia yeast specifically. It just releases some general antifungal proteins along the skin surface, and that pretty much takes care of the majority of yeast. It's more like a deterrent, kind of like bug spray to keep the mosquitoes off. Side note, for all you science nerds out there, one of the main antifungal proteins that our skin produces is called cathelicidin, also known as LL37. Fun fact, in people who have active psoriasis, the psoriatic plaques actually produce extra LL37, meaning that these patients are actually more protected from fungal infections in those areas of psoriasis. Go figure. Back to malassezia. So this malassezia yeast is always around, no matter what. It just lives everywhere. Can't get rid of it. Even if you killed every malassezia organism on your body, it would come back eventually because you'd catch it again. But if everyone has malassezia on the body, how come everyone doesn't get dandruff? It's all about the numbers. Malassezia is only an issue if it grows out of proportion to what our body generally tolerates. So what factors contribute to the development of dandruff? These are the five most common causes. Number one, oils. Oils in general are a food source for the malassezia yeast. So the more oil you have, the more likely you are to develop seborrheic dermatitis. This includes both our natural oils and the oils we add to our skin externally. Major culprits include things like coconut oil. Big no-no. I don't care what anyone tells you. You also want to be careful not to fall into the trap of using tea tree oil. It's true that tea tree oil may have some natural antifungal properties, but it's also a known irritant in our skin and it can cause skin allergy. So if you're using tea tree oil and things aren't getting better, or maybe they're getting worse, that could be why. Number two, hormones. Androgen hormones cause our oil glands to pump out higher quantities of oil onto the skin. You know what happens next. Number three, hygiene. Not washing our face and scalp frequently enough can cause more oils to accumulate onto our skin, which provides more food for the, you guessed it, malassezia yeast. Number four, nervous system problems. Our immune system communicates very closely with our nervous system. Some patients who have problems with their nervous system, notably in Parkinson's disease, struggle with dandruff more. In Parkinson's specifically, it's not that they have any issue making the antifungal proteins that they need. It's more of a problem with their natural temperature regulation on the skin. Because they don't regulate temperature as well, their skin can actually be a few degrees warmer, which allows the yeast to grow more easily. And number five, chemical or environmental irritation. This is the wild card. If you irritate or dry out your skin too much, you can actually get an eczema type of flaking, which can be seen as dandruff. We see this in patients who overclean, over scrub, exfoliate excessively. This is not truly seborrheic dermatitis, which by definition, 
inflammation comes from the oils on the scalp, but it can have the same end result, which is dandruff. Now, our first three causes are the main contributors, and they're intricately connected. For instance, hormones and lack of hygiene both cause more oils to build up on the skin. And more oil means more yeast growth, which means more inflammation. So for those of you who love to use oils on the scalp, guess what? You might be feeding the fire, or at least feeding the yeast. Some oils are a known food source for malassezia yeast, specifically coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil. Basically, malassezia is not too picky. It just likes oil. Okay, those are the main causes. Now, how do we treat it? Now, to treat seborrheic dermatitis, there are two major goals. Number one, suppress the yeast, and number two, reduce the oil. We generally start with treating the yeast first, because that's the most immediate cause of the inflammation. Keep in mind that seborrheic dermatitis is a chronic or long-term condition. There's really no cure. There's just maintenance. We will always produce natural oils in the scalp. As long as our body continues to produce oil, we continue to be at risk for seborrheic dermatitis. There's no getting around it. So our anti-yeast strategy is divided into two parts, treatment and maintenance. So when we have active seborrheic dermatitis, we start with an aggressive anti-yeast regimen. Once everything calms down, then we enter into our maintenance phase, which helps prevent recurrence or reoccurrence or repeat occurrence. Man, stop with your wordplay. Now, when we treat the yeast, there's a calm approach, and then there's an aggressive approach. The calm treatments have what we call fungistatic properties, meaning they stop the yeast from growing. That's nice. The aggressive treatments are called fungicidal, meaning they kill the yeast. That's next level. If you have a mild case of dandruff, there are several over-the-counter options that are fungistatic, and I'll have links in the description for all available treatments that I talk about. And remember, we're treating the skin, not the hair. Seborrheic dermatitis originates in the skin, so you have to rub these shampoos into the scalp, not just the hair. Now, zinc is a a good fungistatic ingredient, that's a good place to start for most. Head and shoulders has 1% zinc and can keep off the most mild of cases. DHS zinc shampoo has 2% zinc, and this is a great option for anyone who's tried something like head and shoulders and they're not quite getting to where they want to be. Then there's coal tar shampoo, brand name tea gel. This stops the fungus from growing and it has natural anti-inflammatory properties. This is one of my personal favorite over-the-counters because in addition to its antifungal properties, it also directly targets the itch. The only problem with coal tar shampoo is that it stinks, literally. 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 It smells like tar. Not everyone can handle it, but if you don't mind a little funk, this is a good option for you. Then there's salicylic acid, brand name T-Sal, which helps remove some of the oils and flakes from the skin. It's not a great direct antifungal. It's a decent shampoo when used alongside other ingredients, but it's probably not going to get the job done alone. Okay, now we're moving on to the real antifungals, the fungicidals. Ketoconazole is the gold standard seborrheic dermatitis treatment. The brand name is Nizerol, and it can be found over the counter in a 1% formulation. This is a great starting point for most, and arguably a better place to start than any of the others that we mentioned. Now a 2% ketoconazole is available with a prescription, and this is my first line treatment for the vast majority of patients with seborrheic dermatitis. Important note, ketoconazole works best when it's lathered into the scalp and allowed to sit for 5 to 10 minutes before rinsing. If you're one of those people who already starts the rinsing before you even get the shampoo on your scalp, I have bad news for you. 10 seconds of contact time probably isn't going to do the trick. Another fungicidal shampoo is Cyclopyrox. This is a decent option as well, although personally I don't think it's any better than ketoconazole. Those are the antifungals. Now, how do we minimize the oils directly? Well, this is where salicylic acid fits in nicely. Its main function is to clear the oils on the skin, which is why it also works as a good acne treatment. So if you have an excessively oily scalp, maybe adding salicylic acid to your regimen isn't the worst idea. But in reality, if you wash enough, pretty much any shampoo will reduce your oils. That's how shampoos work. The detergent in shampoo binds to our oils and helps eliminate dirt and debris. That's what basically all soaps and detergents do, and that's also why if you over cleanse, you can end up with dry skin. But what is over cleansing. How often should you be shampooing? Well, 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 that varies based on a variety of genetic factors and your environment. A good rule of thumb is to shampoo about every one to two days and after exercising. But if you live in a really dry or cold environment and you don't sweat all that much, maybe you don't have to shampoo as frequently. And some people have really textured hair that requires more oil to stay healthy. In this case, shampooing once or twice a week might be right for you. You just have to find the balance. But regardless of your regimen, if you go too long without shampooing, you will develop an overgrowth of malassezia and you will develop seborrheic dermatitis. There's really no way around it. In addition to targeting the fungus directly and the oils, we can also target the inflammation itself. This doesn't treat the cause of your seborrheic dermatitis, but it might take the edge off a little bit. We do this by adding anti-inflammatory properties that can be mixed into lotions, oils, or solutions depending on patient preference. The main anti-inflammatory agents we use for this purpose are steroids like clobetazole, betamethasone, fluosinonide, fluosinolone, triamcinolone, hydrocortisone.
The list goes on and on. One thing about topical steroids is that if you use them for a long period of time, your skin can become thin or atrophied. Fortunately, the skin on the scalp is really thick and robust, so this is a pretty low risk. I usually only see atrophy in the scalp with intralesional or injectable steroids. I don't really see it with topicals. All right, I know there are some of you who don't want to see a doctor and hate to rely on prescriptions for your treatment. This is my tried and true over-the-counter regimen for treating seborrheic dermatitis. If I had to choose a starting regimen, only using ingredients that are available without a prescription, what would I recommend? I'd start with ketoconazole or Nysrol 1% shampoo. I'd apply it two to three times a week and leave on for five minutes before rinsing each time. If you shampoo more regularly than three times a week, I'd alternate the ketoconazole with DHS zinc 2% shampoo. So you're looking at one day ketoconazole, the next day DHS zinc. And if you're someone whose dandruff is really itchy, then I'd add a 1% hydrocortisone liquid, also known as scalpicin. That's a solid regimen that will tackle all but the most severe cases of seborrheic dermatitis. If that doesn't work, it's time to see your dermatologist. Pro tip, if you have severe dandruff that doesn't respond to topical treatment, oral medications such as isotretinoin can be used to reduce your oil production, thereby removing the food source for the yeast. This is not commonly done, but low doses of isotretinoin have shown to be effective when all else fails. Of course, if you've ever heard of isotretinoin, commonly referred to as Accutane, you probably know that's a hassle for everyone with a laundry list of side effects. Not exactly a first-line treatment for a sprinkling of dandruff. That's dandruff in a nutshell. Let me know in the comments if there are any tips and tricks that I missed. Hope you enjoyed your coffee break.